we go. Welcome to New Retina on Monday morning. This is a online journal club where everyone is welcome to bring a piece of science they get excited about. That could be a paper, that could be a book, which is a new category, um, and briefly present it and then we discuss it to the best of our knowledge. Um, today we have the first book presentation and one paper as far as I can see from the chat. So without further ado, I hand over to Michelle. I promised you to go first and you can present your book to us. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, I'm gonna present you this book that I took two years to read. Uh, it's uh, uh, Myelin, the Brain Supercharger from uh, Bernard Zalk uh, and uh, Florence Rosier. You can find it into our chat in the PDF version. Um, I will share my screen so I can show you some of this. There you go. So now you can see um, you can see the book. This is beautiful cover. So if you don't know, the myelin is actually this uh, little sheet that is wrapping the axon and uh, increasing the speed conductivity as well as working as an isolant for uh, the electric charge that will go through the wire. Otherwise, I will be a total mess. All the wires will share all like their information, then we will not be able to communicate correctly in our brain. Um, this book is the life achievement of Ben Azark uh, that he nicely dedicated to me because he's a friend from ICM in Paris and is jam packed with uh, very interesting information about glial cells, not only mining, but also glial cells. So I took some note in my uh, printed version. I'll try to find it inside the PDF. Um, but if you start with the first chapter, I think it can just do this. There you go. Here you have like uh, the real numbers that correspond to the number of neurons in the human brain and the number of synapses in the human brain and the number of synaptic signals that happen every second. So if you look for a reference for these big numbers that are usually kind of fancy or help to teach uh, students uh, about like the dimension and the complexity of the human brain, here you have a book that actually with a, a, a true uh, a scientist that is doing histology for, that's been doing histology for his entire career has been estimating and bringing inside his book. Uh, with accuracy. So those numbers are not exaggerated, like what you can find in the press. Um, those are just sample of information that I found interesting. Uh, you have all the history of like how we discovered myelin and glial cells, uh, which is uh, which is important because I didn't know about like the history of this and we're all very neurocentric. And then other important uh, information that you learn is that uh, the proportion of glial cell to neural cell in the brain is not the same according to species. Um, so, and the, so for example, if you take the drosophilia, like uh, uh, the proportion of glial cell has been determined to be between 30 and 35% of all cells in the nervous system. If you take the rodent, the proportion is 65 to 70% of all the cells with only 30 to 35% being neurons. And in human, it's 90% of glial cells and only 10% of neurons. And so like you see how you can put it into an evolutionary perspective that like the glial cell is really uh, uh, developing all the potential that exist in the human brain. Um, in the introduction as well, I remember I like really like the beginning of the book in the kind of way uh, uh, the authors explain to you what is the main role of glee, which is to increase and finally tune speed in the brain. Um, so I didn't know, but the flea actually doesn't have uh, glial cells. So it, it doesn't, you know, it's only unmyelinated axons. And so this myelination of the axon is prin principally due to uh, uh, the fact that you need to increase speed to go from longer distance in the brain. So that's an evolutionary strategy that happened in the brain. So if you look at very tiny brains, 
usually they don't have either. Um, then here, so you have like, you know, not all uh, glial cells produce myelin. Some others like uh, uh, astrocyte are like uh, feeding the neurons and helping with the process of uh, communication between the neurons. Um, and, and you also have the neural stem cells, which are also glial cells. So do not necessarily produce myelin, but are part of the glial cells that are nicely introduced in this, uh, in this book. Um, and so why is it important? Well, it's mostly because uh, we live in a neuroscientific world which is very neurocentric. So we're really interested about neurons are like this little box is indicating you get about more than 500,000 articles with the word neuron. Um, but if you're interested about glial cell, you have only 100,000. And if you're interested about specific glial cells, these numbers are really dropping. And that's because, you know, it's a new addition. If you look at the history and the uh, study of the glial cell, it's a new addition in the way we look at the working of the brain and particularly something that is developed inside the book very elegantly with a lot of very interesting example uh, that are uh, solid histological example is the link between uh, glial cells and the plasticity of the brain and the development of the brain. Um, so, you know, if that is true, that if you look at the brain on a static perspective, neurons will have maybe the lead on to how things happen. But if you look at how you can modify the functioning of your brain and learning new skills, development or aging, then the glial cell have a crucial interaction with the system. Um, mm, 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 mm. All right, so some, um, some other interesting um, information that I found there. I know we had the debate for a long time with Steffi and those are information that you think you sort of know, but it's always good to find a good reference that is like a giving the exact numbers. Um, so it's been measured that a nerve, a myelinated nerve fibers can go from 288 to 432 kilometers per hour. Okay. Um, and so that's also an information that, you know, we always said 300, 350, but here this is like the, the clear uh, estimation of that speed. And, um, and this is derived from the equation that model never improves condition velocity uh, that led to uh, uh, the Nobel Prize uh, in Physiology of Medicine for Hodgkin and Huxley in 1963. Books, got all those information just in books. Just stop reading papers. Just kidding. Um, I'll, uh, I'll drop the example, but that was just to give you an idea of why it is uh, really interesting. Um, um, then like uh, the rest of the uh, uh, book is going like uh, higher and higher in terms of uh, uh, complexity, uh, going to the uh, fine structure of the myelin and the way uh, everything, uh, like, you know, like the way the uh, oligodendrocytes that produce the myelin actually communicate and exchange. And the books finish with like uh, uh, examples of pathology of the myelin, the mechanism, and uh, what are the latest development in terms of research to uh, compensate from, uh, for pathology of the myelin. Um, Um, I think that's about it. Don't want to give you too many examples. I want to encourage you to read the book. Uh, you found the link in our chat. If you are interested, you can drop me an email directly and I can send you the book by email. Um, and uh, most importantly, uh, if you're very interested, you should buy the book uh, because uh, 
Berna and France spent a long time writing it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. That was absolutely lovely. Uh, before I open up for questions, just two uh, points of clarification, really. So I'm, I'm glad to see we finally get a reference for our speed of conduction. Um, 300 miles, 480 kilometers. So not too far off. <laughs> yeah, we're right in the middle, but you know, it was good to have like the, you know, yeah. Who said it first? Where does it come from? And now we know it's coming from this Nobel Prize in uh, 1962. And we have the exact value. And the equation that relate axonal diameter with mile in sheet and speed of conduction. Having a Nobel Prize as a reference does never hurt, I guess. <laughs> it, yeah. That's the best that can be. <laughs> Um, the other thing I wanted to quickly do is before we open up for questions is that you tell us what DL cells actually are. Because you oh. kind of dived right into it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. What are those cells? How many types do we have? What do they do? So you got like now a, the expert by proxy. So, uh, so but the, the book is about the myelin, and the myelin is supported and fed by uh, oligodendrocyte in the brain. Schwann cell are outside the brain, peripheral uh, system. And oligodendrocytes are glial cells. Glial cells, by definition, I know are non neuronal cells in the brain. And they include like uh, uh, microglia, which is absolutely awesome and can like travel from one area of the brain to another area of the brain by itself just to clean it up. Uh, ependymial cells, which are like the stem cells. Um, that you can find a little bit everywhere in the brain, but mostly um, at the level of the ventricles. And they have like a, a cilia and they can like move when they're not transformed uh, the uh, CSF. And after a stroke, apparently they can transform in neurons to uh, provide support to the brain. That's, I mean, like I'm, I'm just amazed by that. You get astrocytes. Astrocytes um, uh, not only feed the neurons, but they also modulate the blood flow and they can uh, modulate apparently uh, neurotransmitters by uh, seeing reuptaking and releasing uh, the precursors or neurotransmitters, if I remember well. Um, I think that's a bad. It. Uh, I'm not an expert of glial cells, of course, even though I read the book. <laughs> um, another thing that I found fascinating in the book is throughout the end, but like there is a clear demonstration, and people have been able to show that oligodendrocytes change the myelin conduction to synchronize the inputs in one region. So let's say you have a region A and communicate with uh, B, C, and D and uh, to trigger the action, which would be moving your finger, you need to have B, C, and D that arrive at the same time onto region A with uh, uh, electrical afferences. Um, this is some very fine tuning when you <laughs> look at the speed of conduction and the amount of uh, electric charges uh, that will arrive at the same time. And this is very finely tuned to be perfectly synchronized by the oligodendrocytes, influencing on the myelin that will modulate the speed of conduction that will make your signal arriving at the same time in the region. And I, I, yeah, this is one of those fascinating uh, uh, biological evolutions and that made like the, the system of the brain so finely tuned. Lovely. Any questions? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, the book, sir. Uh, I just uh, wanted to ask you, um, uh, if, do we have information uh, about uh, 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 similar proportions, uh, proportion of glial cells or their functioning in non-human primates? Because uh, if we are thinking about uh, maybe evolutionary contribution of- Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So it is not in the book, 
uh, but I'm sure somebody must have counted that, and if not, they should, because that's that's a very interesting question. Um, and having like different primates will give us a possibility to really infer that with this is like something, this 90% of glial cells, is this something that is specific to primates or it, you know, is it something that happened earlier in the phylogenetic tree? And, you know, it's a good question. The same thing is like, uh, so you have a lot of myelin to compensate for the long distance that have been traveled by connections. Uh, but, um, you know, I didn't see, and it is not reported in the book whether anybody did a uh, correlation between the proportion of glial cells, or particularly oligodendrocytes, and the size of the brain. Uh, there should be a relationship there. And, uh, and if the relationship is linear, it will be maybe terribly boring. If the relationship is nonlinear, I mean that there is something even more than just compensating for size. Thank you. Yeah. Leah, you had a question as well. Uh, yes. Yeah, thank you for presenting. Now I'm curious about the book. And um, I wanted to ask like about the structure of the book. So it's like uh, more uh, based on topics. You said at the beginning there is an introduction and then uh, some pathology examples, or is it more like historical? Because usually like in these books that are like in the big, uh, uh, not review, but like state of the art. So sometimes you have like a lot of reference to articles that uh, uh, the funding has come up. How is this book? Uh, All right. Yeah. Sorry, I went like quite fast on this, and I don't have, I didn't really have in mind a good structure to explain the book. But the structure is the following. Um, so first, and it's, it's a smart structure actually to uh, to write a book. So uh, if you want to write a book, I, I found this uh, pretty good. First chapter is to tell you why you know myelin is so interesting. So it's like so funny example, like uh, the brain of uh, you know the brain of the flea, or you know it's just doesn't have myelin, and why do we have myelin? And there are like all these funny things about you have to react fast, and how much time would it take if you didn't have myelin. So the first book is like lay reader. The first chapter is lay reader, getting you into why it is important. Then the next chapter, how about how did we discover that? And why is it important? And how did we understand the functioning of it? Uh, which expand not only onto myelin and oligodendrocyte, but cover also all the glial cells because those discoveries happen at the same time and were made by the same people, okay? Uh, then it dived directly onto very advanced uh, measurement and biological things that happen with the myelin at, at a level of structure and interaction that I never thought about. So I was kind of like, whoa, this is, this is really advanced, which I think reflect really like all the latest work from the authors. And it finished up with all the relationship with behavior at a bigger, bigger level, uh, um, where they nicely cite my work, uh, but I really liked it. And the pathologies, and you know, this myelin pathologies, and what are like the current treatments that can happen. It's yeah, it's about um, and also reference I in the end. So it's it's well referenced. You have good examples and original references. By origin, I mean who was the first for every statement that I made in the book. And that, that's why it's so valuable for us because it helps us to not only think differently and embrace like really the vision from somebody who spent his life working on this, but also if we'd like to uh, take the train of the glial cell with uh, uh, those authors, now we have the good references and the logic and the credential to do so. And that, that's why books are so important. Okay, thank you. Lovely, thank you very much. Any other questions, comments? Yes. Yes, yes Evie. Yeah. So Michel, we discussed uh, not a long time ago about the, the parallel between evolution, so between uh, phylogeny and ontology. So I don't know if the is uh, discussing about that as he has a chapter about evolution and a chapter about development. Uh, 
Um, uh, no, no, oh, I missed it. Or oh, like, yeah, I didn't see any uh, any link being made here. And um, and you know, the onto uh, like the philo devo philo onto hypothesis. Yeah, philo onto just <laughs> link. So you know, there are some there are some links showing it, but like a lot of it has been debunked. Um, uh, particularly like the the princip work from echo have been have been debunked and they showed the, there was some problems there and there are also papers showing that there is a, a link but you know i think this is really a hypothesis that needs to be investigated properly with current technologies and um and nice evolutionary maps and uh so i guess like a, a good first step would be to do the first evolutionary brain map <laughs> so yeah no it was uh it was not really discussed uh one more question that just came up in the chat and you might actually know the answer to it is if einstein had more myelin oh that's a very good question no, it was mm. a joke uh, it was a joke <laughs> Mm. Oh. All right, so we don't know if Einstein had more myelin. Uh, we don't know if Einstein had more myelin, but uh, part of his brain has been sent to Marianne Diamond, who worked on uh, enriched environment and sickening of the cortex. And we know he had more glial cells, particularly astrocytes. And so if you use a lot of your brain, this paper, a paper from um, Yannif Yusef, for example, if you play video game and you play all the time a different circuit or you play all the time the same circuit, you'll have differences that happen very quick into your hippocampus. Um, if you play uh, all the time uh, uh, the same circuit, and this is because you map those uh, this circuit into your brain and those differences that happen in just two hours are related to an increase of the size of the astrocytes. Now, um, and they know it because they did it not only in humans, they did it in mice in parallel uh, using a uh, uh, kind of a, a pool maze paradigm. Um, and um, so in the case of Einstein, that's not only the size of his astrocytes, that's also the number of them inside the cortex that were, that were more important. That was in his parietal lobe and to be linked with his fantastic ability of abstraction, of projecting himself visually inside the problem and finding those uh, uh, metaphor or conceptual representation of the problem that help him uh, debunk our fundamental physical questions. Thank you very much. Ah, oh, Victor, yes. Hey, good morning. I just had a question that came to my mind right now. It was, did they talk about in the book about uh, the way we have today to uh, measure how much people have uh, of myelin, how much myelinated, my, myelinated uh, their accents are in vivo and what kind of technique we, we have today to, to do that? And to... No, no, this is not something that is covered in the book, and it's mostly because the authors uh, come from the histological wet science world uh, and take the results from MRI just for granted and don't question their validity because this is not their field. Like, I will not question the validity of the histological reports. <laughs> That's uh, just as simple as that. Uh, so they report findings, but there is no um, there is no chapter on to advance in vivo measurement of myelin and how we would do it. Okay. But there are some examples of application, particularly particularly in uh, the neurodevelopment, plasticity, and pathology that are derived from uh, MRIs that quantify the myelin. They just don't discuss the methods. They just All discuss right. the results. Thank you. Bye, Abe. Bye, Abe. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <clears throat> well, that was an exciting uh, discussion. If there are no further questions from what I can see, uh, we move on to the next paper.
Meanwhile, I go on YouTube. <laughs> I should. Okay, um, so uh, this is a, a review on uh, comparative neuro anatomy, uh, and it was published at the, the end of uh, January, but they had the chance uh, of reading it uh, now, and it was from uh, Mars, Jacobi, and uh, Rushworth, I think. And um, I really like it for the um, uh, how much it was clear in the explanation and the figures are uh, really informative. Indeed, I'm uh, going to um, explain the review starting from uh, the figures. Uh, at, the, um, at first, uh, uh, of course, uh, um, so not first the title, so a common space uh, for uh, approach to comparative neuroscience. So they are trying to find uh, which is the best strategy to uh, compare different uh, species, but also uh, different modalities, because uh, now we are able to have uh, uh, a lot of information, so not uh, uh, about the brain, not just uh, from uh, one uh, uh, methodology, but to several. And so uh, questions arise to uh, how to combine all these uh, uh, knowledge and uh, which is the uh, best approach. So uh, here uh, there is an explanation of all the possible uh, ways uh, that you can do comparisons, uh, find the similarities or uh, um, what is different uh, between the different uh, species. And uh, so uh, to build this new framework, um, they uh, talk about uh, this uh, uh, vertical translation and horizontal translation. So uh, in the vertical translation, you can see here, you have a comparison between different modalities, but within the same species. Otherwise, when we talk about horizontal translation, we have uh, uh, the comparison of the same modalities, but different species, so across the species. And then you can compare these uh, uh, approaches. So uh, for example, you can study cortical folding uh, together with um, uh, cortical myelin, as we talk about, or uh, tractography or gene expression, uh, expression in the same uh, uh, species, or uh, translate. So the first approach is use the same modalities across the species to make a comparison. So let's imagine in this uh, uh, radar graph that you have different species uh, and you can have the same modality. Uh, for example, here in yellow, let's imagine like uh, the default mode network study in the different species. In green, the uh, tractography investigation. And then uh, you can have also other modalities in some species uh, that you don't have in humans. So for example, in blue, in, in blue tracers uh, uh, method. So um, this is all the information that uh, you can have and uh, you have to uh, put in together. And uh, one way to do it is uh, uh, using uh, an abstract approach. So extracting uh, uh, features that can uh, uh, help in the uh, comparison of the different species. So they suggest uh, principal components, space embedding, or just uh, measures like uh, the strength of connectivity, something that can be like uh, an, ab an abstract feature that you can compare. And so uh, bringing all the information in a common space that is uh, comparable. Because usually, uh, um, as we know, there are differences uh, about the brains uh, across the species and uh, about the size, the regional expansion, uh, the increased lateralization, new, new projections, uh, or change in the connectivity uh, strengths. Uh, so all this information that uh, um, brings some uh, difficulties in the comparison, but it's also the interesting part. So. Um, here a way to extract this information and uh, uh, use it in the informative way. And to do that, they suggested to use, uh, they say three ingredients. So um, the first one is the multimodal information. 
the second one is to uh, focus on local data, so uh, local information. And the uh, third ingredient is the abstract uh, feature to space. So um, a features-based comparison uh, in a common space. So something that is abstract and then you can overcome these uh, uh, differences that we have in, uh, in the brains of uh, across the species, but you're able to make an informative comparison. And uh, so, as uh, we have said, uh, vertical translation is the uh, same species and uh, uh, different modalities. So here, vertically, for example, if we focus on the human brain, uh, you can see that uh, here we have uh, um, uh, the uh, T1 situated maps that uh, can uh, resemble um, the gene expression in different cortex layer. But uh, uh, here you see that uh, um, each map seems to give like uh, a, a detail of this uh, um, of the of um, the T1 T2 uh, weighted images. But if you do a, um, a principal component of uh, the uh, different layer gene expression, you have actually something that is comparable to the first one. So uh, a, a comparison across modalities and, you, and using these uh, uh, new embedding uh, states, so a feature base to make uh, um, a, a comparison. Or uh, you can go uh, not vertically but horizontally and uh, you can try to compare different species uh, in the same modality. Uh, in, um, in the same modality, and uh, uh, you have, you can find like um, a um, correspondence, for example, between uh, uh, some cortex layer, and use that uh, for uh, um, guide the uh, registration and the com uh, the comparison. Uh, you can uh, um, and so like uh, you, and um, like a, unfolding a comparison between different species and. Uh, uh, sometimes you do like correlations of correlations. So uh, is um, what I understood is a way to find uh, both the similarities and differences. And you can make, for example, this uh, map of unpredictability. So uh, uh, how much is the difference across the species? And um, and then you can also combine these different approaches. Mm, there was here, so uh, you can uh, uh, do both horizontal and vertical translations. So, for example, when you have the same modalities across the species, you can uh, use it for a comparison, but also uh, you um, create uh, like a prediction and see um, how much is the, uh, the goodness of this uh, uh, prediction. And you can use this registration then uh, can be applied to other modalities. For example, the, uh, the investigation of the arcuate fascicular projections, how it's different across the species, if it is, if it is more vertical in uh, primates, how, how much is the expansion in uh, humans, and uh, and then you can put everything so in the same space and uh, uh, see um, for, uh, here in humans uh, how much is the prediction in the human space and uh, how is the human actual arcuate projections and so here you can make an unbiased comparison because you bring all uh, all the information together in the same space. Or uh, when you have, uh, uh, for example, tracers information that are uh, available only in uh, primates or uh, other species, but not humans. And uh, you can use like um, a, a method that you have uh, in both species, uh, such as like tractography. Uh, and uh, um, you can use this registration to then uh, um, make informative information also in humans of uh, uh, some tracers information that you have here just uh, in the macaque. And uh, uh, yes, this can be made also for uh, um, 
other, um, I think it's this, no, there was also an example in the test about the, the food mode network that you, you um, is uh, was proof to, to uh, be detected in across different species, but the involvement uh, of the areas are actually different. Uh, so um, you can make all these uh, um, comparisons that uh, I imagine are really uh, never done, but I imagine that are like, uh, uh, challenging, but uh, this is a, a framework how uh, these approaches uh, could be done. And um, so I think, yes, that's it. And of course, there are a lot of um, um, important references, examples that are really uh, uh, well explained. Um, and uh, yes, this was the part about the, the food mode network. And so, this is what I understood from the article. If you have any questions. Thank you, Leah. That is a very interesting paper, quite clever. Um, are there questions? Patrick. Yeah, thanks for presenting this. Really, really cool. I, um, for some reason, I haven't got this paper yet. I even asked uh, Roger about it on a research gate, but he hasn't answered. So, what I was wondering is, um, has, do they propose different common space approaches for the different modalities? Or is it always along the same lines? Because for instance, um, like some, some while ago, I think 2018, Roger um, published this, um, this white matter blueprint a uh, paper as one way to establish a common space um, between species, but this is potentially not feasible in other modalities, right? So how did they um, solve this? Um, maybe Michelle and Stephanie have a better answer. Actually, I I don't know. Yeah, uh, I I think this So uh, oh sorry. Yeah, for the purpose of clarity. So I'm writing a book with Roger. So we, we, we speak actually very often about these things. And um, one of the key is the multimodality of the data. So if you have enough different measurement uh, for each of your species and those measure, the key really is a comparability between your different samples. And if you do the same measure several times, if you do different measures that are the same between your samples, then you can concatenate it into the same space. Uh, for example, if you take uh, uh, macaque and humans and you do uh, uh, diffusion, uh, myelin, um, electrophysiology, uh, and other things, uh, and you concatenate enough data together, then you'll be able to uh, bring them into the uh, common space, which will be based on the similarity in the measurement. Does that make sense? Yeah, but from a technical standpoint, does this mean that the data should be not only similar in terms of the modalities acquired, but also in terms of the dimensionality? Or uh, it's not they... necessary. So, so you can concatenate anything if you have only one point of similar. If you have like one point of similarity, this point of similarity might be uh, like Roger has been doing. Uh, so you use uh, an atlas of the connections. So you compare I four and I four between two species, arcade and arcade between two species, and so you can line them up together. Mm -hmm. Another way is to do it based, and that is what it suggests, multimodality, which would be completely data-driven. It's just you acquire the same modality in all your sample, and then that will be your point of, of comparison between, between your, your participants. So it will not be based on the space, so it will be based on, on profile on this uh, different a point of measure. And the more you have, the more accurate will be your space and your distance between your sample. But this still doesn't really answer for me 
like what is the method behind it? So is it an embedding technique? Is it dimension reduction first and then looking at similar like reduced components or? It's a, it's a good, well, it is a review. So it's not an original paper. Mm. Uh, I guess, no, so it, I didn't read that paper, but there are like different way to do it. And what they suggest is a PCA to probably to cancel out the noise and focus on the main, you know, driving factors. Um, and, and then the embedding, and they speak about embedding, you have many differences, different approach for the embedding, which here, I don't think they take like a solid standpoint or stance on to one method compared to another. It's more the idea mm. of doing it rather than how to do it uh, in terms of like practical method and algorithm. Uh, but we'll get there, I think, one day when we have enough data, um, hopefully. Yeah, yes, really like, cool. like uh, looking uh, through the papers, like here in the horizontal uh, translation, you can find uh, uh, so the, the technique, a little bit like some tips uh, you, you were looking for for the comparison. So uh, at the first approach, they suggested to uh, use the homologous spatial landmarks. So you, uh, for example, a cortical, uh, the same uh, such as the primary school tree, um, a cortical sheet folding that you, get, you can have both in macaque and humans, or you can use this approach also uh, from in, like starting from the cingulate and parietal cortex. So you they should, they, then there, is, there are also the reference, but use landmarks. Uh, here there is this blueprint connectivity that maybe you were talking about, uh, where uh, you created this connectivity fingerprint. This is like a matrix, uh, cortex, uh, white matter uh, connectivity. So you have this big matrix that uh, uh, here's your uh, connectivity blueprint. Uh, otherwise, if you want to focus on the embedding, as we were saying, here we move on the vertical uh, comparison and you can use both the principal component but also other methods. And uh, here it's also, of course, for the embedded, you uh, will use the features. And here there are some examples about the connectivity strength. If you want to see what the article said. But um, I mean, the, the main question here was um, if they they suggest somehow to to try and use all these different embedding techniques or different comparison techniques um, with regards to the individual modality, or if they can kind of propose like one generalizable solution that fits it all. Uh, no, no, they don't say that. They don't. They don't. They're not proposing. Uh, um... Like, like they don't make like uh, uh, a classification. So which is the best method or not? They just report all the methods for the purpose mm -hmm. of this vertical and horizontal comparison. No, they don't uh, say this is better or not. Sometimes they say this was uh, like at the beginning uh, and there was an evolution. So now we can compare it better this way. Uh, but they they just uh, uh, present all the methods and the specific the specific uh, the specific features of all the methods so they don't propose the better one which is the best one yeah, thanks for clarification that uh, <laughs> makes me want to read it now <laughs> mission accomplished <laughs> <clears throat> right are there any other questions on this paper not that i can see at the moment nothing over on youtube well, with that, uh, thank you very much for coming today. It was lovely to have your company this morning. And we shall see you next week again for more exciting science. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>